Hello and welcome everybody to today's ISC Squared Security Briefings webinar. Today I have the good fortune of having John Gamble on, who's the Senior Director of Product Marketing from Corelight, today's event sponsor. And he's going to be focusing on the power of open source tools for network detection and response. And I know we spend a lot of time here talking about commercial tools and the people and processes we need to run them. So I'm very excited to have John here to talk about some open source alternatives. He's going to dig into a little bit of the architecture how to stitch this all together. I think you're going to really, really enjoy today's conversation. Before I turn things over to him, however, I'm going to play a short introductory video to cover off on all the housekeeping items, and we'll be right back with John in 60 seconds. This is a security briefing, a deep dive into a cutting edge cybersecurity topic, bringing attendees a better understanding of issues and technologies. Security is part of IT. You know, I, I know that sometimes a controversial statement. In general, I want to say ransomware should be treated as an inevitable event or incident. This webcast is interactive and we want your questions. Please submit via the questions tab and we'll address as many questions as possible during the time we have for this webinar. Don't forget to leave your feedback and comments as well as rating in the Rate This tab. We take all feedback and comments seriously, and we want to hear from you. CPE credit will be submitted for ISC Squared members within 5 to 10 business days. If the presentation is freezing, please refresh your browser. Now, get ready for a security briefing. John, I'm super excited for today's conversation. As I said at the, at the opener there, lots of open source technologies. I know myself and a number of my friends and colleagues run these in our own labs. And I'm here at InfoSec World in Florida, along with Hurricane Ian soon, should be arriving. So I, I've had a few conversations around these technologies already since I've been here. So I'll get out of the way and turn things over to you. I'm going to keep an eye out for questions and comments from the audience. So please uh, save me some time at the end for those. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I am dialing in from San Francisco, California, and I'm excited to talk to you today, as Brandon mentioned, uh, about some really great open source technology, specifically security technology uh, designed to help you understand, monitor, detect, and defend your network environment. Um, so with that, let me give you a little bit of a background about myself, and we will dive into the agenda and get started. Um, so I am the Director of Product Marketing here at Corelight. I've been at Corelight for five years, and I've spent my entire career uh, in the cybersecurity space, uh, representing a range of products, uh, most recently Endpoint before Corelight, uh, identity verification, security technology as well. So um, I've been to a, a number of uh, uh, security conferences over the years. Suffice it to say, I've gotten to talk to uh, hundreds of thousands of security professionals in my career, gotten to uh, visit them in their security operations centers all around the globe. Uh, and what I'm excited today to talk to you about is to share some knowledge uh, that has been shared with me uh, by many of our customers and just generally security professionals out there who have uh, pioneered uh, the use of some of the open source technology uh, that we're going to talk about today to help them understand and defend their networks. And my goal today uh, is to give you an introductory overview uh, to some of these tools. This is not a deep uh, level two, level three uh, technical talk. Uh, we're not presuming any prior knowledge of these tools today. So that there's an introductory kind of um, uh, kind of 101 talk about some of these tools. And if you'd like more information, there's a wealth of, of deeper material out there. Corelight provides some of that material, but, uh, but dozens of other organizations, including these open source organizations behind these tools, uh, have great documentation, great training videos, great uh, manuals as well. So with that, let me give you a preview of today's agenda. First, we're going to talk about architecture and network detection response. We're going to ground the discussion in kind of what are the components, uh, the technology components of a, of a network detection and response kind of stack or strategy. Um, and what are the benefits that come with using open source tooling in developing that architecture and strategy? We're going to double click and do a little bit deeper dive on two specific open source tools today in the stack. There are dozens of open source security technologies that one could use. Uh, we don't have time today to cover all of them uh, in, in, in deeper detail, but we are going to dive deeper on two specifically, open source Zeek and open source Suricata, two key uh, evidentiary and detection uh, side network tools. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about those tools uh, in, in parts three and four of today's agenda. 
a brief word from today's sponsor. I'll kind of explain where Corelight fits, fits into this picture and why we talk about open source so much in our company. And we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. We'll hopefully have about 10 to 15 minutes left for Q&A. So please uh, don't hesitate to type in your questions into your question box. I would love to answer questions. So let's dive in. Architecture, uh, network detection and response. You know, I think the NDR acronym has gained a lot of ground in the last 12 to 24 months, especially. Um, but uh, I don't want to presume uh, deep uh, knowledge on the audience. I think it's still kind of a, a growing kind of uh, awareness uh, in, in the space. So EDR, right, endpoint detection response, I think probably most of you on the phone are familiar with, and you probably use some of those tools or currently use some of those tools uh, in, in your in your day, daily job. Um, SIM technology, right, security incident event management platforms. Um, there's dozens out there. Uh, you may well be using one currently at your security team or have one running in your home lab. NDR, uh, network detection response, is sort of the, the mere image, right, of EDR, except it's obviously on the network. Um, and it involves kind of, you know, equivalent detection, response, visibility capabilities, as you might find at an endpoint. On the endpoint side, uh, obviously, that is typically a host or agent-based uh, technology that's deployed on endpoints to provide you that visibility, detection, and response capability. On the network side, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the tools one could deploy, um, but it's typically uh, a passive uh, out-of-band deployment where you're basically monitoring a copy of network traffic, whether that's on-premise or in cloud environments, uh, and performing similar detection uh, analysis tasks on the network traffic as one would on endpoints. And ideally, uh, in, in a kind of unified environment, uh, you're streaming both the network side NDR telemetry and the EDR endpoint side telemetry into a single source of, of kind of truth or, or data lake environment, typically a SIM. If I could just make the case for a second for NDR um, in today's conversation, because I know a lot of uh, companies and organizations uh, and teams are considering NDR technology, and you might have to make the case, the business case, right, for network detection response technology to your boss, uh, to your company, uh, right, to, to be able to create budget to invest in, you know, the, the time, the resources, the people uh, needed to stand up a net network detection response capability. Even open source, right? Open source, yes, it's free. That's one of the benefits of open source technology, uh, but it's free like a puppy, right? It, it requires care, maintenance, feeding, uh, and, and time um, and skills, and, and that can cost uh, you know money. And sometimes it costs uh, hardware costs as well to run this open source technology on. So I wanna just give you an argument or two um, that you can take back to your organization if you're making the case for network detection and response capabilities in your own environment. Why do you need NDR if you've got EDR? Uh, well, there's kind of two key arguments I wanna make here. Uh, one is about breadth of visibility and detection capability. Um, EDR is great. Uh, but the E in EDR, it stands for endpoints. It doesn't stand for everything. Uh, it stands for endpoints. And EDR only goes where your endpoint agents go. Um, and there's a whole world uh, and, and, and class of attack surfaces that EDR just can't cover, right? Uh, it starts with BYO, all of the devices uh, that your corporate uh, IT department doesn't control, right? The, the laptops, the, the, the phones the IoT devices that uh, end users or employees uh, or partners might bring into your corporate environment. Endpoint doesn't cover uh, you know, uh, a lot of internal kind of data center facing traffic, right? If you've got sensitive data centers and east-west communications between those data centers, i.e. communications that are not touching uh, out to public internet infrastructure, um, your EDR agents are probably not going to be running on your data center. Um, EDR also doesn't really help you in the cloud, right? A lot of companies are investing in cloud workloads, uh, you know, in environments today like, you know, AWS, Amazon. Um, your EDR agent is not going there. So there is just a range, right, of potential attack surfaces uh, that EDR is not going to be covering. And what what NDR offers as a benefit is, is properly instrumented and deployed. It gives you an immediate breadth of visibility, right? Because if you're positioned to monitor all network communications in the right spot, you're going to capture everything. You're going to capture, if you're deploying it internally in east-west, the data center traffic. If you're deploying it at the perimeter, all communications, right, crossing that perimeter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the network is great for breadth, and endpoint is great for depth. Um, they can both provide breadth and depth, but the, the, the breadth tends to come from the network side. It's a lot easier to obtain, and it can cover all of those areas that I mentioned uh, where EDR agents don't go. 
The second argument I'll leave you with on NDR, if you're making the case for network detection response to your team or your organization, is about resiliency and reliability of information. Um, EDR is excellent uh, when you can trust the integrity of the device operating system uh, and hardware on which the EDR agents are running. But in advanced attacks, uh, especially nation state driven attacks, um, those sophisticated attackers often are able to fundamentally compromise the hosts themselves, um, you know, the operating system, even down to the kernel level, right, for zero day exploits. And when that happens, EDR agents can become unreliable narrators. You might have EDR coverage on those devices, but you fundamentally can't, necess you can't trust necessarily the information coming out of that agent because the device itself on which that agent depends has been compromised. Networks, by contrast, um, you know, theoretically, right, if you are capturing, monitoring, uh, and analyzing network traffic, you have an immutable, unchangeable record of what has occurred. Uh, and, and there's a phrase in security that you may, you may have heard before, the network can't lie. And the idea there is, yes, attackers can do all sorts of devious things, encrypt their traffic, disguise their traffic, try to hide in the noise of traffic, uh, to try to evade your analysis and monitoring capabilities. But at the end of the day, if you're properly positioned with the right tooling to monitor, analyze, and defend your network, uh, you've got an advantage because the attacker can't really avoid crossing the network. There's very, very, very few attacks out there in the world that don't touch networks at some level. Um, and if you're prepared with an NDR capability in-house, uh, you've got that immutable record. The attacker can't avoid pushing packets, whether that's on-premise or the cloud, and it gives you that backstop record that can't lie about what actually happened. So let's talk a bit about architecture. What are the components of a network detection response strategy? And then we'll overlay this diagram with some of my favorite open source security tools in this space. So you're gonna need a detection capability of the network. Obviously that's the D in NDR. You're going to need an evidence or data uh, layer, um, right? Incident response kind of fundamentally depends on the availability of evidence or data to be able to validate, triage, deeply investigate, understand scope, and ultimately understand the remediation path to the problem that your analytic or detection has surfaced. You may also want to go to the deepest level of network uh, kind of evidence analysis, which is packets, the actual you know, machine code uh, kind of construct of network communications. Some security investigations, some incident response investigations do require you to go to that fundamental you know, layer of network traffic analysis, which is the packet layer, which means you're going to need a packet capture capability, a packet analysis capability. You're going to need a place to actually consolidate this information, this telemetry coming out of your environment. Most typically that's in a SIM. I mentioned that you'll need a packet analyzer to go with your packet capture. And for a really advanced architecture, you're going to want some orchestration and automation and remediation capabilities, right? SOAR. Um, okay. If these are the components of NDR, what great open source tools could we potentially layer on this diagram? I'll give you examples here. This isn't the end all be all definition uh, of open source uh, NDR architecture, but it's just some of the more popular uh, tools out there. Um, some of which you may have heard of before today's uh, presentation, some of which may be new to you. Let's, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's overlay this with some open source technology. Suricata, Suricata IDS intrusion detection system um, is a great open source network detection response detection engine. Um, we're gonna talk a good deal more about Suricata today, so I won't belabor that point. You can also use open source threat intelligence feeds uh, and, and overlay that with your, your network traffic analysis capabilities to generate great you know, IOC precision driven, signature driven alerting capabilities. MISP, is a great open source threat intelligence feed, for example. On the network evidence side, how are you actually going to understand what's happening on your network in an objective manner and do incident response against some of the alerts you might be generating from the left-hand side from tools like Suricata and MISP? Zeek, uh, open source Zeek network security monitor is a fantastic tool uh, to help you understand your network and generate rich, actionable evidence uh, for incident responders and or threat hunters to use uh, to conduct their investigations. We're gonna talk a, a good deal more about Zeek on today's call. On the packet side, uh, Archimy uh, is a great open source uh, packet capture and analyzing uh, tool. It includes an analyzer as well and a user interface. On the SIM, uh, we have of course, 
Elastic, a great open source uh, kind of you know incident uh, event manager and log query and management tool, very popular. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of Elastic. If you've heard of any of these tools on, on this screen today, you've probably heard of Elastic, um, if not others on this screen as well. A, a more kind of approaching the more advanced end of these uh, kind of deployment architectures, right? Automation and response capabilities. The Hive, a great open source uh, toolkit uh, for kind of incident response workflows and some starting to give you some automation capabilities in terms of response as well. So again, here's an example where I've taken uh, an approximate architecture of network detection response capabilities and I've overlaid it with some of the more popular best in class open source tools. There's others out there. Um, these aren't the only ones, uh, but these are just the ones that I wanna share with you today. And we're gonna talk specifically in more detail about Suricata and Z. But before we do that, let's just back up for a second. I mentioned open source is free, right? That's one of the benefits of open source, but it's free like a puppy, right? There are costs to open source and I don't want to paint a picture of open source as the easy free button. Um, what, what can you expect? What, what should you be prepared for, right? Well, in many cases, you're going to be needing to acquire uh, your own hardware. Um, these pieces of software that I just mentioned on the prior screen, Many of them are dependent uh, on, on actual hardware. Um, you actually have to buy the hardware to run the, soft, the open source software on. So it's a BYOH situation. Um, then you're gonna wanna you know, deploy, but it's, it's depending on the scale of your network environment and the complexity of your environment. Um, most likely, unless it's a tiny little home lab with a little bit of traffic, there's gonna be some, some tuning, debugging, um, packet loss kind of, you're gonna have to work through some of that with the deployment of these tools. Um, then there's kind of the administrative side, right? Um, depending on what tooling you're deploying, there's curation, um, you know, uh, uh, settings, um, troubleshooting, uh, you know, management of packages and updates to these tools, right? These tools that I just mentioned on the prior screen are dynamic and living. And there are not only iterations of the software itself that you're going to have to manage the next version and installation of, but often these tools are dependent on other sources of information, such as a threat intelligence feed or a rule set feed you're going to have to manage the, the curation uh, of that feed. Um, in a small home lab, you can stand up some of these tools very quickly, um, minutes to hours. Um, in an enterprise environment, depending again on the scale of your network traffic uh, and complexity of your network, um, that, that's definitely days, days to weeks. And at very, very large enterprise, we're talking Fortune 2000, let's say, very, you know large network throughputs in the gigabits per second range. You're talking weeks to months. Um, I've even seen Fortune 100 companies take, you know, uh, the better part of a year or more uh, for for their security engineering team to stand up some of these tools at enterprise scale. So there's a wide range uh, of time to value, um, but it, it it roughly correlates to the scale uh, uh, and complexity of your network environment. And then, of course, there's the ongoing care and feeding of these tools once you've got them deployed, uh, tuned, configured, performant integrated and you've trained your team on these tools, um, there's gonna be ongoing kind of maintenance and monitoring of these tools as well. So I don't tell you this to scare you off these tools uh, by no means, right? Um, thousands of people before you, if you've never used these tools before, have successfully deployed these tools, but I do wanna prepare you uh, for what you can expect if you are interested in using these tools in your own organization. And let's drive home the value of why you would even consider these tools uh, at NDR with some, some, some use cases. I wanna arm you with some, some great examples that you can take back to your team, your boss, your organization about where this technology, network detection response technology with open source tooling could really help your organization. First use case, uh, accelerating incident response, uh, a, a kind of shared universal pain when I talk to, to analysts, security analysts out there around the globe, um, who are not kind of approaching network uh, security with a, a holistic NDR capability is the pain of incident response, the pain of unresolved uh, tickets, right? Alerts that came through that, that, that a tool that they deployed generated and they just didn't have the information they needed to be able to successfully validate um, that. And so it stays in an unresolved state. Even the ones that they are capable of investigating with the data they have at hand can take hours or days, or they have to go bug the IT team, right? For access to the information they need on the network to be able to resolve that. Um, 
with this kind of approach, network detection and response, using some of the tooling we showed on screen prior, um, you really can dramatically accelerate the speed and efficacy of incident response in your organization on the network side. And specifically here, I, I, I just call out some tooling, right? You can imagine a world where you're using Suricata, an intrusion detection capability. You're using a rule set, uh, feeding that engine with, a, with, with thousands of alerts, uh, right? An alert fires. And because you've deployed other tooling in your environment, let's say Zeek, and you're using Elastic as your SIM, uh, as a security analyst, you now have the alert from Suricata, the evidence you need to validate and investigate that alert, and you have it in a single uh, place, which is Elastic, uh, source of truth. So you could actually go to the deep levels of investigation you need to, to be able to validate that Suricata alert that's firing. If you just have Suricata firing in a vacuum and you don't have great network side telemetry, uh, you might, not be able to resolve that particular alert that's being fired. It might be a true positive, but you might not be able to validate that because you don't have the evidence you need on hand to do so. Threat hunting is also a big use case. Once you can holistically monitor and understand your network, um, all it takes is one person uh, with time and interest to start threat hunting and start looking through this series of information being generated by these tools in a sim like Elastic. And suddenly you can take an idea, hey, I wonder if, uh, someone is abusing my DNS traffic to exfiltrate data, for example. Well, now you can do, you can answer that type of a, a, a question, a threat hunting hypothesis, because you have the tooling at, at your disposal uh, to be able to go in Elastic, for example, and type in a query and say, well, show me all the DNS queries that are extra long beyond 25 characters, for example. And I'll start there because maybe that's benign, but maybe that's evidence of somebody trying to exfiltrate data uh, via outbound DNS queries for example. Custom threat detection, right? Once you stand up these, this tooling like I showed you on the prior screen, you can actually empower you and your team to create net new detections. You don't have to be single threaded on an open source rules feed necessarily or a commercial vendor providing you threat detection. Um, with open source tooling, one of the great powers is you're in control. Uh, you can modify, you can build on top of this open source tooling and you can develop custom threat detections. I always tell uh, uh, folks that I'm talking to that I think the single most powerful threat detection you can build is not, the, the, the technology behind it is, is far less important, whether it's machine learning or a signature is, is less important than how, how uh, accessible that detection is to the adversary, right? That you're trying to defend against, right? The single best threat detection you can create, whether that's a signature or a machine learning algorithm is the detection of one, the detection that is unique to your organization that came from your own learnings about how your organization is being attacked or could be attacked, and you turn that into a detection. You take that knowledge and you turn that into a threat detection. You build a signature, you build a behavioral detection alert, you build an ML model uh, in Elastic, for example, where there are toolkits to do so. And now you have a detection of one, which means the adversary uh, doesn't necessarily know you have that. Unlike commercial detection technology, which adversaries love to get their hands at commercial detection technology and reverse engineer it, you've now built yourself a detection of one. And also increasing the velocity of your response time uh, when P1s break, right? When that next new zero day hits the news cycle and everybody's scrambling on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Sunday to, to address it, right? When you go with open source tooling, you have the power of community, the, the, the winds of the community development globally at your back, which means you often have an advantage uh, because someone else, someone out there in the open source community has already developed an analytic a capability uh, to help address this zero day that was just discovered and publicized. Um, so that's another great benefit. Um, in many cases, you'll find if you use open source technology like we showed on the prior screen, um, someone will have already done the work for you and you can just simply grab that work uh, that's freely shared in the community and deploy it in your own environment. And now you have a zero day detection capability on day one of that zero day uh, being disclosed. Some resources here on screen. Um, this recording will be made available uh, along with the slides. So I'll just show this briefly, but uh, all of these projects, right, that I mentioned on the prior screen, including some that I didn't mention, like Wireshark, for example, which is a great packet analyzer, um, have really great open source kind of project websites. They have resources that'll point you to, you know, setting it up in your home lab and also helping to tune it at enterprise scale, integration information, um, documentation, uh, onboarding videos, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, all of these projects, you know, have communities behind them, right? Because they're open source. And part of that community open source development is also uh, a web presence to help onboard people to these tools as well. I wanna also just point out um, two resources that Corelight freely provides that might be helpful in this respect. Uh, we have a threat hunting guide. Um, it's a detailed 35, 40 page manual uh, that provides guidance on how to go about hunting uh, for MITRE attack based TTPs, techniques in your environment um, using um, open, the open source data format Zeek. So if you're interested in using Zeek, and we're going to talk more about Zeek and Suricata in just a minute, uh, would really encourage you to go download that guide. It's a free guide and it'll really help you and your team think about how to monitor your network and look specifically uh, for adversarial techniques in your network environment using the Zeek data format. Um, we also provide some free uh, rules, uh, queries in the SOC Prime threat detection marketplace. Um, these are Sigma based. And if you're not familiar with Sigma, Sigma is a, an open query standard uh, that allows you to take queries uh, and plug them in across different uh, tools, different SIMs, for example. So you can take a, a Sigma query uh, and plug it into Elastic or plug it into another SIM, for example. Um, and these are freely available rules that uh, take some of the guidance in the threat hunting guide and, and actually apply it to pre-built queries. So you can just copy paste them into your own Elastic environment, for example, and be off and running uh, on your threat hunting journey. Open, right? The, the alternative to open is closed, right? You could, you could be uh, you know, choosing a, a purely commercial kind of locked uh, more black box type of network detection response platform. But again, the topic of today is open source. So uh, just to, to drive home some of the benefits of open source, because um, you, your team, your boss, your organization uh, might be hesitant to use open source technology. Some organizations uh, gravitate towards open source and some organizations um, are a little bit hesitant to embrace open source technology. But just to quickly make kind of the higher level case for open source here, for you to help equip you if you're interested in using these tools in your own environment to talk to your peers and boss and, and such. You know, there's a there's a spectrum here between closed and open, right? Um, the benefit of taking an open source based approach to network detection response is, is basically controlling your own destiny, right? You own the data, you own the data format, you control your detection strategy. Um, it's it can be more work, right? Just just like a puppy isn't free, open source isn't free and requires care and feeding and tuning, but it gives you a lot more control. Um, I think many people on the phone have probably had it, uh, could think of something recently in the last couple of months where they've been frustrated with one of the security tools that they've invested in, commercial security tools that they've invested in, a problem, a false positive, uh, a capability that they didn't have, something that wasn't quite working. And in all cases, that's a, that's a customer success, um, you know, uh, support event, right? That's a ticket. You have to reach out to your account contact, they open a ticket, um, they debug, they tune, they build, they address your concern. In open source, um, you can go to the community, but you can also fix the problem yourself once you reach a certain level of proficiency. So it's a tremendous amount of control and flexibility uh, that open source tooling brings in house um, that gives your organization a lot more control over your own detection analytics uh, and incident response strategy on the network side. I'm not going to go through each point here uh, just for time, but there are a number of dimensions uh, on the evidentiary and detection side of NDR where open source technology can really help you. It gives you a lot more choice uh, in terms of data export, right? There is a world of tools out there that will accept um, some of the analytic and evidence data formats that we talked about on the prior screen. Uh, Elastic being just one example of a SIM, but there are dozens of uh, SIMs and data lake type of technologies um, and analytic environments that will accept uh, these open source data formats because they're widely used and because they're popular. Um, on the detection side, right, uh, choice. There are so many different analytical tools, whether they're open source or commercial, um, that support some of these open source network detection response data formats, analytic formats, which means you might deploy an NDR strategy, uh, NDR architecture using some of the open source tooling like we just showed on the prior screen, there's also a world of commercial technology out there uh, that supports uh, many of the tools that you saw there on that screen, which means you have a lot of choice. You're not locked into a highly proprietary system where if in a year from now you decide, you know what, I'd like to swap out this analytic tool uh, with something else. I'd like to swap SIM vendors, for example, a year from now. 
when you take an open source-based approach to NDR, you have a lot more choice because you can take all of the data and analytics that you've generated in the prior year and take that to a new environment with a lot more ease than you can when you're dealing with a, a vendor proprietary data format uh, and analytic format, for example. And here on screen, I just show you uh, kind of a, a logo splash, right, of tooling out there um, that accepts uh, some of these data formats, right? And on the right-hand side, you know, I just picked two commercial vendors in the space and showed you the list of, of places they can export their 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 own data formats and analytic formats to. You can quickly see the list is much longer on the left, right? Um, open source is open to integration and industry tooling. Seeing that customers use these kinds of open source tools globally, those same vendors want to support that as well. And so that's why there's such a, a range of exportability choice you have uh, when you go with open source technology. I mentioned this argument earlier, but I wanna drive it home with a specific story. Um, one of the benefits of open source technology is you've got the winds of community at your back. Um, and two great proof points uh, that illustrate this, the power of this uh, come from two prominent kind of exploits uh, in the last uh, two years. The attack on the solar winds Orion technology um, that happened about a year and a half ago, uh, where a nation state adversary uh, had, had basically uh, compromised the signing certificates of the, of the tooling and actually shipped malicious code inside of the commercial product, which gave them a backdoor into the networks of many of the world's uh, most sensitive organizations, right? Uh, a tremendous kind of exploit that all security teams had to address immediately. Um, and Log4j, uh, right? The, the exploit in the Log4Shell library um, that affected pretty much every piece of commercial software out there running um, and was a real scramble for security teams to address. And are, they're still addressing to this day, right? There's just so many tools that use that uh, vulnerable library out there. Um, in both cases, something very interesting uh, happened of note. Uh, the Suricata community, the intrusion detection system open source tool Suricata that I mentioned earlier that we're about to talk about in a little bit more depth, um, that community jumped into action. And, you know, you might be on the Pacific coast of the Americas like I am, right? And, you know, it's pretty early here. Uh, the security teams on the West Coast, some of them are just waking up uh, in the next few hours. But with an open source community like Suricata behind you, um, there might be a Suricata developer, uh, open source developer uh, on the East Coast or in Europe or in Asia Pacific region, who's already been up for hours and has read the news cycle and looked at the IRCs and looked at the technical reporting and written a detection capability against an exploit like you see there on the left. And that's in fact exactly what happened in the case of these two, these two incidents, uh, these two exploits. Um, customers that were using Suricata had available to them in a matter of hours, uh, detection capability on day one of these new cycles breaking. Other customers I talked to uh, that were dealing with these problems, in many cases, were simply spending the first couple of days after these exploits were announced, simply inventorying, uh, understanding if they were even using vulnerable infrastructure or software related to these attacks. The investigation of where we hit and what's the scope, and what's the remediation path, that would come days, weeks later in some cases, versus the customers that were using the open source, right? They could answer that immediate question. Am I, am I currently being affected by these attacks? So speed of response when you're using open source can be tremendously faster. And if you're not um, using a tool like Zeek, which we're gonna talk about in more depth in just a second, um, incident response on the network side can be really quite difficult. Um, I, I describe it as sort of a bad puzzle game. Um, if you're simply grabbing the available telemetry, the available data from your network environment that comes stock, uh, as part of network appliances, right? So NetFlow, for example, right? You can pull NetFlow off of routers. Um, your firewalls uh, will generate some logging information about what's happening in those network communications. Your network appliances themselves will generate logs uh, or data about the nature of communications crossing those appliances, such as DNS records, right? Off of your DNS server. The problem is most of these data sources, right, that one would normally grab from the from the network side um, were primarily designed for IT use cases, not security use cases, which is to say, you know, networking teams to debug, troubleshoot, tune the, the actual appliances themselves. Security teams use them because they're available, but they were never, in, in most cases, they weren't actually designed for security use cases, which means A, they're missing information that security teams would often need, and B, these information sources were never meant to interoperate well. Um, right, they, the timestamp like uh, UTC code, right, can differ, for example, between various 
uh, network appliances. So you might be sitting there as an incident responder trying to line up two different timestamp formats between two different data source sources. Also, right, the gaping visibility holes that some of these sources of data leave, um, you could you could drive a ship through, right? And that's exactly what adversaries do. Um, they can do things like encrypt their traffic or hide in the noise of DNS traffic because it's so darn noisy uh, to do things like establish C2 or exfiltrate data. That's incident response on hard mode. But I want to show you what a different world could look like. So now we're going to shift gears and we're going to go deeper on two of the tools that I mentioned earlier. We're going to learn a little bit more about Zeek and a little bit more about Suricata. Zeek, uh, among other things Zeek is good at, open source Zeek, is addressing the exact problem that I'm describing to you here on screen. Instead of playing this bad puzzle game where the pieces aren't all on the board and the ones you have don't fit well together, there's a different way to approach this problem. And Zeek, which I mentioned, is an open source network security monitoring tool, is a great tool for the job. What you see here on screen is a splash of some of the logs that Zeek generates, mostly protocol specific logs in the, in the case of the screenshot that you're seeing here, that, that get rid of that bad puzzle game we saw on the a previous screen and give you a single unified clean source of network side evidence and telemetry to help you as an incident responder or a threat hunter make sense of what's actually happening on your network. So let's double click on Zeek. Some of you may have heard of Zeek to, before today, uh, today's presentation, some of you may have not. Um, Zeek is an open source, um, Berkeley Software Development License tool, the full name, the Zeek Network Security Monitor. You might also be familiar with it by its prior name. Um, it's actually quite an old tool, tool by security tooling standards. Um, the first lines of code for Zeek were actually written in the mid nineties. Um, so this tool has been around for decades, quite literally. Um, it used to be called Bro, uh, the, the Bro Network Security Monitor. So that might be uh, uh, the former name of this tool that you might be also have heard before. Bro and Zeek, same thing. It got renamed a few years ago. It's now the Zeek Project. It's a passive, deployed out of band, network security monitoring tool. Um, thousands of organizations uh, are using this tool around the globe today. It's been in, in use, as I mentioned, for decades. Um, and it does three things fundamentally well. It takes raw network traffic and all its packet grittiness and transforms it into objective summarized logs that kind of, you can think about it sort of like spark notes for your network, right? Um, it takes all the raw packets and transforms them into these protocol specific logs that are interlinked. And we're gonna talk more about what that means in just a second. These logs don't sit out in a vacuum. Um, they're actually interlinked by connection. So every connection is stitched together um, with, a, with an alphanumeric string. So as an analyst, you can actually retell the story of what happened on your network uh, by pivoting easily across the different log types because all the connections are, are kind of stamped with this unique identifier. The second thing Zeek does exceptionally well is it actually extracts files from raw network traffic. So file-based analysis is obviously a key source of evidence and information uh, and a key source of malware delivery and really important in security operations to be monitoring files. That's often where you get hit. Uh, with executables, for example, and Zeek can extract and reassemble hundreds of different file types. So it can be a great source of uh, files for file-based analysis from your network traffic. And the last thing that Zeek does exceptionally well is it's actually a programming language under the hood um, whose default state generates a lot of great evidence, i.e. logs or extracted files for you, but it also has its own scripting capability. And there's a community uh, of folks that develop uh, scripts for the Zeek tooling as well. Those are everything from a threat detection uh, capability, a new threat detection capability, an actual script, to a new um, analytic uh, network side uh, kind of uh, analytic capability that may not necessarily be a threat detection, to developing entirely new uh, protocol parsers, new logs, right? If a new protocol comes out or there's a protocol that you wanna monitor that Zeek doesn't already monitor, someone in the open source community can actually develop and write that. A great example of that I'll give you is Amazon. Um, Amazon uh, uses open source Zeek uh, and they contribute back to the community. Uh, and they did this a couple of years ago. They, they open sourced a couple of their um, OT uh, protocol parsers that they had written um, for kind of uh, warehouse shipping uh, protocols, based protocols, and they open sourced that. They gave those protocols that their team had developed back to the open source Zeek community. So just a small example of, of kind of the community development uh, behind this tool. That bad puzzle game screenshot that I showed you earlier, right? Um, Zeek is really, really good at distilling. Um, I said Spark Notes, sort of like Spark Notes for your network. It gives you exactly the information you need as a security uh, professional 
and nothing more because more is noise, more is um, you know extended time to complete the investigation as you have to sift through the noise. Um, Zeek logs are, are kind of exceptionally um, um, kind of efficient from a data perspective, right? Each log can contain anywhere from a dozen to two dozen fields of information describing that particular aspect of the connection. Typically, it's a protocol-based uh, log. You see here on screen, for example, there's the con log, which is sort of the master connection log in the Zeek taxonomy. It's sort of like NetFlow. You can think about it like NetFlow on steroids, sort of. And it, it's the master log that describes the connection. But from that log, you can pivot into all of the protocol-specific activities. You can actually reconstruct the story of what happened on the network. So you could pivot into the HTTP log, which will describe uh, the HTTP session that occurred. And you can pivot from there into the files log, which might describe the file download event that occurred as a result of that HTTP session. All three of these logs are all stitched together uh, via an alphanumeric string unique to that connection, um, which gives you as the analyst the ability to quickly pivot and quickly reconstruct and quickly understand what actually happened in your network traffic. So it's the right evidence in the right format, um, connection oriented. Uh, so you as an analyst can quickly pivot through it and tell that story very quickly. Zeek.org, uh, you know, I flashed this, this URL up on screen earlier when we looked at the, the uh, other tooling out there as well. But I really, again, we're going to go deeper today on Zeek and Suricata. So Zeek.org uh, is a great place for you to get started. There's a really active mailing list. So email uh, kind of user group you can get on. There's a really active Slack group that's fantastic. Um, I'd be remiss also not to mention that the end user yearly conference for Zeek is coming up in about two short weeks in Austin, Texas. Um, so if you head over to Zeek.org and you go to the events tab in the menu, uh, you'll see Zeek Week uh, and you can register there if you're interested in attending or you already happen to be in the Austin or Texas area and that's an easy drive over. Um, there's still spots available. So uh, get over there quick if you're interested in attending. You'll hear from some of the kind of leading uh, developers uh, end users, thought leaders in the space. I know they have a, a really um, exceptionally, you know, uh, exciting keynote speaker um, uh, from, I believe, from Palo Alto a Research Group, who's going to be keynoting. Um, great user conference. If you're brand new to Zeek, if you're interested in using Zeek, it's a great place to head over to start your journey in person in Austin, Texas in two weeks. There's also going to be a virtual component as well. Um, so you can dial in and watch the talks afterwards as well, which will be recorded and put on YouTube. If you're interested in commercial alternatives to Zeek, I would also be remiss to, not to mention that you can come talk to us. I'll talk a little bit more about who we are, Corelight, at the end of this presentation uh, in a few short slides. Uh, but if you are interested in Zeek and you're looking for enterprise great alternatives to just pure DIY open source deployment, uh, come talk to us. We can help you there. Suricata, let's switch gears. So Zeek is a fantastic network security monitoring uh, and evidence generation tool. It helps teams, security teams and analysts make really light and fast sense of what's happening in their environment. Suricata is sort of like the jelly to the peanut butter of Zeek or the peanut butter to the jelly of Zeek, depending on how you look at it. Um, Suricata and Zeek go hand in hand and you'll see many uh, organizations co-deploying these tools because where Zeek is really excellent at helping you make fast sense, objective sense of what's happening, um, Suricata really excels at generating alerts and signals and um, potential um, kind of evidence of, of bad things occurring in your environment, whether that is a, a vulnerable system all the way to an active exploit being used to a known piece of malware and everything in between. Um, much like Zeek, it is a very popular, widely deployed tool by thousands of organizations globally. It can actually be configured as well in IPS. I'm not really gonna go into that today. Uh, it's typically deployed uh, in the IDS uh, form, intrusion detection system form, so passively and out of band generating alerts, but it can also be deployed inline as an intrusion prevention system as well. Um, it came out of and evolved from the SNORT project, which you might be familiar with. Um, it's primarily signature driven in its detection methodology. There is a range of both commercial and open source uh, rule sets out there. So. The open source ones are obviously free for you to, to, to install and run uh, on your Suricata engine and generate alerts. Um, and most typically customers are consuming these alerts in the same environment. Quickly flash on screen what you're actually gonna see in terms of alert format. So what you're seeing here is an actual Suricata alert. And if you direct your attention to the left-hand side of the screen, I'll just quickly kind of run you through kind of some of the information you could expect being generated out of a Suricata alert, right? So you have a category up top, right? This is potentially bad traffic in this case. 
Um, so on the range of kind of conviction uh, uh, of whether this is a, a, a true positive or um, you know a false positive, you know it's potentially bad traffic. It's being flagged as something you should probably investigate, but isn't necessarily uh, a, a conviction. You also see that reflected here in the severity score. So Siracata alert formats also have a severity rating built in, which is a great thing because as an analyst, right? One of your key problems is noise and prioritization uh, of your queue. Um, and so a severity score is attached to these alerts, which means you can sort by severity and triage by severity appropriately. Um, the actual name of the signature behind this alert uh, is displayed here. So ET is the Emerging Threats Rule Feed. Um, it is uh, a generic suspicious post in HTTP um, to a dotted quad with fake browser alert. So now you're getting a sense of, okay, this is an HTTP traffic-based alert about potentially bad, you know, HTTP session, for example. And then, you know, as you continue down the line, you're getting more information about the, the flow, the connection itself um, that can help you launch your investigation, right? These are, this is the launch point. Now you've got an alert. Now your job is to validate it as a tier one incident responder, for example. And you could launch yourself from this alert right into the Zeek evidence that we just looked at to actually help you validate, oh, is this potentially bad? Is this actually bad, right? That's the first step in the incident uh, kind of response life cycle. So let's see, we got about 15 minutes left. Um, I want to just spend 60 seconds uh, to give you a quick little kind of overview of Corelight and what we're about. I mentioned if you're interested in open source Zeek, you should come talk to us if you're interested in commercial grade alternatives. Same thing applies for Suricata. If you're interested in Suricata and you're interested in looking at enterprise alternatives, you should also come talk to us. We bake both of those key technologies, open source technologies under the hood of our commercial network detection response platform. And in fact, we position our platform as an open NDR platform because it's based on these open source technologies, but that's not all under the hood. Um, Corelight's open network detection response platform also includes packet capture capabilities. Uh, also includes a SaaS-based analyst uh, interface. So if you don't have a SIM or you um, can't find the budget necessarily to put all the evidence and analytics from your NDR implementation into your SIM, we also have a SaaS-based solution uh, for end users, for analysts to actually uh, investigate, validate, uh, and or threat hunt in their environment using Corelight evidence and analytics based on these open source tools. So Corelight offers an open network detection response platform um, Zeek and Suricata are two of the key kind of technologies under the hood of our platform. So if you are interested from an open source perspective, Corelight represents a great commercial grade alternative to DIY deployment. Um, but that's not all. There's also a wealth of proprietary analytic capability under the hood of Corelight's platform as well. We've got a great research team uh, led by Dr. Vern Paxson, um, who actually is incidentally the inventor of Zeek uh, 25 years ago over at Berkeley. Uh, and that's kind of the founding story of where Corelight came into this NDR space is from their Zeek heritage. Just a quick kind of splash of, of some of our happy customers here uh, on screen. Um, as a marketer, I can say it's an absolute pleasure uh, to represent Corelight. I, I really haven't talked to happier security customers in my career. Um, it, it is truly a pleasure. Uh, and these customers, you know, can't imagine a world without these capabilities that we've just discussed, right? The Suricata and Zeek communities. Uh, and they've chosen Corelight as, as kind of their commercial vendor of choice to help them deliver these network protection response capabilities, whether that's on-premise or in the cloud in hybrid environments, Corelight can go everywhere and everywhere uh, in between those environments. So if you've got AWS workloads, we've got a solution for you there. If you wanna monitor your data center traffic, we've got some really high-end appliances, we can help you out. Um, and, and really, I, among other benefits, I just wanna emphasize quickly, and then we're gonna turn it over to Q&A for a remaining 10 minutes. Um, you know, why do customers from the open source community uh, who are, you know, big proponents of some of this open source tools, why do they come to Corelight uh, and cut us a check? Among other reasons, um, it's about the opportunity cost of their time, right? It's really hard to hire great security people. You know that. Um, and it's, it's really hard to retain great security people as well. Um, and one of the benefits we can offer you if you are interested in these open source technologies is, is we kind of take care of that puppy for you, right? Um, you don't have to worry about any of that. All the time that you and or people on your team would spend tuning, configuring, maintaining, uh, integrating, et cetera, et cetera, it, it is kind of gone. Um, our commercial solution and our team behind it uh, take care of that for you. And in the case of uh, uh, of one of our law firm customers, right, as, as that information security engineer said on screen right there in the middle, you know, Corelight took care of it for us and gave us back more bandwidth so we can actually go threat hunt. Um, 
that's one of the great benefits of coming to Corelight as an alternative to some of these open source uh, tools if you're interested in using these capabilities but aren't necessarily interested in maintaining them yourself. So with that, we've got about a little over 10 minutes, 11 minutes left. So I think we're going to turn it over to Q&A. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to, to dial in today. I hope you've gotten a good overview, uh, a taster was, as it were. That was more than I anticipated. That was a lot of information. We had some questions come in about uh, the presentation because I know there were a lot of links and resources. Yes, that's available over in the attachments and links section. Definitely grab a copy of that. And uh, John's team has also put some other resources up there around uh, uh, NDR and threat hunting and such like that. So let's dig into some of these questions because there's some really good ones here. And, and I want to make a comment before we do. And that is you talked about kind of the, the trouble in finding talent, right? One of the benefits of using this is a lot of my friends and colleagues and, and people even just getting started who, who can't afford to, to get their hands on commercial tools, run this stuff at home. So it's easier sometimes to find people that know these open source technologies, which is a huge win. And, and one of the questions coming in though is, what about mingling this stuff? You, you had that slide with some of the commercial products that have open data formats. What should we be looking for as potential pitfalls or maybe even opportunities when we're blending some open source technologies to kind of fill in some of the budgetary holes that we have in our product stack? Yeah, great question. And I'm going to answer it in just a sec because I want to plus one what Brandon just said. It's a great point and one I didn't make, but I'm glad you made it. Um, from a from a recruiting perspective, as he, as he mentioned, right, there are thousands of people out there using these tools already. And so advertising a role uh, where you're using these tools can actually be a, a, an attractive for a candidate to coming in the door. It's also great for retention, too, because you can position it. You know, if someone learns these tools skill sets, technologies in your organization, it'll prepare them in their career eventually. You know, most people change jobs these days. It's a great way to retain talent as well because you can offer them the ability over years to become experts in some of these tools, which will make them an even more attractive candidate down the line. So it's both a great recruiting and retention capability when you're, when you're uh, an open source friendly organization. But to directly answer the question, right? So, yeah, we've got uh, on the left-hand side, we've got a suite of open source technology we can choose from. I flashed a couple of logos up on screen for the architecture example. There's others we didn't talk about. And on the right-hand side, there's even more <laughs> commercial. As many open source tools as there are, there's there's five times as many commercial uh, uh, tools as well that, uh, in the space. And interoperating the two is, is a common design pattern that we see out there. And, and many of our customers, Corelight's customers, are doing this today. They're, you know, they may even buy Corelight and maintain some of their open source infrastructure, right, uh, to, to supplement, right, or vice versa. Um, so A, it's common. B, the tool, the commercial tooling out there, many of them support the open source. But the question I think was really about what should we be aware of, pitfalls, things to think about when you're blending uh, open source and commercial technology together. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I'll give you some examples. There's a lot to think about. We could literally probably spend 10 minutes talking about just this question, but I'll give you some things to think about. So um, there's a difference between ingestion and parsing. What do I mean by that? Um, sure, the output of your open source tool might be JSON format, which many security tools, commercial on the right-hand side say, yeah, we can take JSON, no problem, right? That's the ingestion piece. But the parsing, uh, that's that's really the key part. And what I mean by parsing is, fine, you have a JSON file as an output, fine, the commercial tooling can accept it. But is it actually, is the are the fields, the data fields of that alert or that evidence format coming out of the open source tool, are they actually mapped to the data schema of your commercial tooling? Because the data schema of your commercial tooling is fluid. It may change, their developers may release a new version and that may change the data format, right? And so it's not just getting the data literally piped into your commercial tool. You need to think about, does that tool actually support and talk to all of the fields generated? And the answer to that question in many cases is yes, but in some cases is no, or they may be upgrading that tool and you suddenly, suddenly some part of your open source input is breaking because their commercial tool hasn't properly indexed it uh, to their data format. So that's just a caveat of something to be aware of. But again, many of these tools, right, recognize that these open source things are so widely used that they they try not to let that ever happen. But as you start to bleed off into some of the less popular commercial tools, let's just say, you may encounter problems there. So 
again, we could talk about this topic for 10 minutes, but that's one thing to think about. Um, it's not worry, just getting John. the data in. I may be following up with you myself uh, on a couple of questions. Another couple of questions that came in, answer this one really quickly, because I got a few more I want to get to. What about cloud environments? Do we deploy these yeah. things in, as uh, Docker containers in our cloud environment and it just parses that traffic? How do, what's some tips there? Yeah, um, so real quick, the big three cloud environments, you got GCP, you got AWS, uh, and you've got uh, Microsoft Azure, right? Uh, each of them, Microsoft still in beta, sort of, but let's say AWS and GCP have uh, GA traffic mirroring capabilities built into their cloud environments. So you can hook into live copies of their, of their network traffic. Um, Microsoft, you can do the same in Azure environments today, but it's typically agent-based. So you're gonna need to rely on a commercial vendor who deploys an agent in the cloud environment to do that traffic mirroring capability because Microsoft's um, public uh, mirror isn't yet GA. So A, you can get you can get traffic mirrors in cloud environments, which is the first step, right, to NDR. Um, and two, can you deploy open these some of these open source toolings in those environments? You can. It depends on which tool it is. It depends on what architecture you're going for. But I've seen customers do it in the open source community, so it's definitely possible. There's big caveats there, but you it's not that you can't port these tools into your cloud environment. In many cases, you can. Um, Great. I'll cut that answer for time. Yeah, no, that's perfect. <laughs> uh, two questions came in. They're pretty similar, so I'm going to blend them to one so we get a two for here. Uh, tips on HTTPS, right? We've got TLS everywhere now, a lot of blind spots. Anything open source that can help us uh, parse that as well? Yep. Um, so it's a great question. So, uh, yeah, TLS 1.3, right? HTTPS, DNS over HTTPS, right? In increasingly, DNS traffic is encrypted. Traffic encryption is just as a trend, right, up and to the right. A majority of your corporate network traffic today is encrypted. That's a very safe assumption. What can we do about that? Uh, and what specifically can some of these open source tools do about that? I'd say there's kind of, there's two fundamental capabilities that some of these open source tools can, can give you in this, in this situation. Um, the first is a Zeek capability. Um, so Zeek is a really fantastic uh, uh, analyzer against encrypted traffic protocols. So it's not decrypting, it's not breaking and inspecting, but it's taking the observable elements of, of what you can see there and generating logs describing that. So there's a log for SSH traffic, there's a log for SSL traffic, right, um, et cetera. And you might be saying, well, like, what do you actually see there? The answer is actually quite a bit of information, quite a bit of metadata about the state of the connection itself um, that's actually quite actionable. And TLS 1.3, for example, right, reduces the amount of observable uh, handshake that you can see in the encrypted negotiation. Um, but Zeek has this capability called uh, SSL fingerprinting, JA3, you might've heard, that's a popular capability that the open source Zeek community developed. Fingerprints, TLS connections, still works with TLS 1.3 as an example. So your visibility isn't completely removed, A. And B, if you have the keys to decrypt the traffic, um, then, it's, then it's game on, right? Um, so you can do packet-based analysis. If you can decrypt those traffic, if you actually have those keys, you can run all of the tooling we just saw against decrypted streams, obviously. Um, so there's one, the answer is just because something's encrypted doesn't mean you've removed visibility uh, completely. And two, um, what, if you do have the keys to the castle, you can actually run all these tools and we see customers doing that in some environments. That's awesome. Great, great overview. Again, lots of great resources, folks, over in that attachments and links section. We also have uh, additional information on getting you registered for the upcoming Security Congress in Las Vegas at Caesars Palace. Great lineup of content. I'll be there. I'm hoping to see many of you there as well. Should be a really good time. For those of you just getting started, you know, John and I talked a little bit about using some of these tools in your home lab and environment and such. We also have information on the certified in cybersecurity entry level certifications just come out from ISC Squared. Great way to kind of showcase your skills and talents, build a little confidence, show where you're coming from to prospective employers if you're just getting started in this community and career. We've also got our LinkedIn profiles up there as well, so you can connect with us, follow us, uh, stay connected, and stay a part of that conversation. We also have the latest issue of the award-winning Info Security Professional Magazine. So lots and lots of great resources over in that attachments and link section. Definitely avail yourself of those. Also, let us know what you thought about today's presentation. Um, great information on the open source side, a little bit of a departure from some of the things we normally discuss. So we want your comments and context on that as well. That's very important to us. Don't just give us a star rating. 
For those of you catching us on the archive, thank you for your time and attention, but we love getting your questions answered while we have experts like John here. So please double check your comms preferences so that we can make sure that uh, you've got enough time in your day marked out to join us live and get your questions answered. With that, everybody, I want to say thank you very much for your time and attention. Be safe, be well, and I look forward to continuing the conversation soon, everybody.